one of the the takeaways that I had as a business owner uh, through COVID for small businesses was that no small business should ever allow a customer to come into their store without capturing their cell phone and email address. Uh, because once COVID hit and customers aren't coming in, but they still may want your product, but they're banned from coming in from whatever regulation or they're afraid for their safety, is you, you can call them, text them, hey, you know, 15% off uh, of you know, home delivery, we'll bring it to your door. Yep. You know, uh, but if you don't have your customer's information, you are literally stuck uh, at the mercy of whoever walks in that door. And so for the, the takeaway for all business people listening is that you should have a, a gimmick or a giveaway or something Every person that walks in the door, that they exchange their information for some gift or some 10% off or something, yep. now you're ready to go. Like I say, switching your business model to 80% delivery overnight, they could have been texting those people and, and hey, let us bring you a pizza buy at half price tonight. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? Mm -hmm. You know, and so it's really important. Welcome back to How to Invest in Commercial Real Estate. Today is an exciting day because we have Bob Parker from Owasso Land Trust on. And today's going to be a cool episode because I think as far as asset management and property management and leasing, those, those I mean, there's a lot of jobs out there. If you want to get into commercial real estate, if you want to learn about commercial real estate, there is endless amounts of opportunity in asset management, property management, and leasing, right? And and for a lot of people, that's kind of their entry or their exposure to, wow, this this could be awesome, right? So before we get into a ton of that, let's just get into to who Bob is, a little bit about the background. What are you doing now? I know you're with the Wasso Land Trust now, but you've been in this industry a minute. You've been in, in several different shops. So give us a little bit of rundown about some of your experience. So I uh, started in 1994. I was came out of the steel business uh, in Atlanta. And came back and went to work for Whiteside and Grant, just regular broker joker, walking the streets, knocking on doors, trying to do some deals. Like, and, will you list your property? Will you sell? Yep, yep. I, I'm Bob Parker. You should yeah. do this with <laughs> me, right? Uh, I, I know nothing. Uh, I uh, stepped out of sales still. So, um, did that for a few years. And then in 2000, uh, I got to know a guy that worked in real estate at Walmart, which I didn't really know Walmart had. I, mean, I knew they bought real estate and did stores, but I didn't really understand the idea of corporate real estate. I uh, got to know this guy over the years, and uh, I had just gotten my CCIM designation. And he goes, man, we really want one of those CCIM guys here. Everybody, so how, wait, how did you meet this Walmart real estate person? A uh, friend of a friend, man, like uh, fraternity guys, okay. uh, Arkansas fraternity guys. Okay. And, and so just, hey, this guy works at Walmart. You should get to know him. Okay. So, guy named Scott Stokenberry. Turned out to be the smartest redneck I've ever met from Paul Huska. You'd think he, you'd think he doesn't even know how to plant corn, but he's freaking brilliant. Um, so in 2000, I and I had said this to my wife before. I said, "God, I really, I really like the like the idea of being in charge of a shopping center or an office building, something where you get to kind of look at it from a strategic standpoint, a long term standpoint, not just a hit them and quit them deal." Right. Uh, uh, I, I just I like the idea of. Of, of that stability and that, and that long-term relationship stuff. And so, uh, and coincidentally, I'd said something like, like maybe the Sanditons. Well, I did, I did Walmart for three years, got rid of dark stores. So you were working for Walmart? Yeah, Missouri, Kentucky, Tennessee, Missouri, Texas. So Walmart would uh, leave their 100,000 square foot regular store to go to a super center. But either. they own the, the but they own the building. They would either own the building or be in a long term lease. Yeah, right. which they did a lot of sale leasebacks to fund their growth right. in the eighties and nineties. Did you work with Stan Johnson at all during that time? It seemed like he did some stuff with Walmart, kind of starting out. Yes, may have, may have been that was earlier than two thousand. He was doing but yeah, that. yeah, not on the disposition end, but they did on the front end because okay. he was doing a lot of the sale leaseback sales. Gotcha, gotcha. exactly. That, that's it was so complicated. They would they would package twenty, thirty, forty stores, put it in one thing basically a financing tool mm -hmm. and it would be a 20 or 25 year lease which worked great if you stayed in the store yeah but if you moved if you left that store it got a little funky uh particularly on the full disposition end because you had to untie these things that's one of the, the one out in broken arrow that sat there at 71st and uh, 193rd for all those years it was in one of those gotcha. which is what complicated its disposition it seems like a tough thing to do go own a hundred thousand square foot building and have to lease I gotta say yeah something. I mean it I mean, sounds like a real piece of shit a vacant Walmart it's, it's harder than it sounds I, I went over there full, <laughs> it sounds hard I went over there thinking I was going to show them 
you know, how to, how oh, to do all things. These and then uh, I got really good at flea markets, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 Hispanic uh, markets down in South Texas, uh, Hobby Lobbies, um, uh, uh, Atwoods, uh, you know, I've had your list of, of potential tenants that about can take 100,000 square feet. About 10 of them. And then, <laughs> it was, then it was, you're done. You're like yeah, sitting on it, figuring out what to do. And uh, so, but after a few years at Walmart, you kind of, you, you're either a Walmartian or you're not, right? And so I had gotten what I needed out of it <laughs> and came back to Tulsa. And coincidentally, the Sanditons were looking for someone to run their real estate. Uh, Scott Sanditon had passed away and uh, you know, Jolene, his, his widow, needed somebody to do it. So I got to, I just, it was just bizarre to get to slide in that deal. And so they had 10 or 12 shopping centers and parts of this, parts of that, a lot of old Otasco properties because oh, yeah. they were the old Oklahoma Tire and Supply. Oh, okay. And so a lot of leftover stuff there and then a lot of stuff that Scott had bought uh, in partnerships. And that's the first time I learned about syndication and LLCs and how mm -hmm. to do that because yeah. he, that was his gig. And so did that for a few years, then got introduced to Ben Latham and Rusty Richardson. And they were doing advanced auto parts. Yep. They had their shopping centers, and then they were doing the advanced auto parts. So Are they developing doing, those? Yep. Okay. So from kind of 03 to 08, when things fell apart, um, they maybe did 30 or 40 of them. So that was great. I didn't have to do anything on the front end. We had a guy that was going out, finding the dirt. They were building the building. I got to sell them. And it was, you know. Nice. Uh, so, so, uh, seven, That's a seven, lot better than a vacant Walmart. Seven, right? seven and a half caps. Uh, but it was basically commodity. Worked a little bit with Stan Johnson uh, to help to get some of them done. Those were fun years because uh, I. But what I had learned to do uh, over those years was how to run a center, how to run a multi-tenant property year over year, doing the budgets, taking care of utilities, taking care of maintenance, talking to these tenants because most of them, frankly, are just mom and pops are just mm -hmm. people that wake up and run their insurance company, run their mm -hmm. nail salon, run their restaurant. And so that's, that's my skill set yeah. is, is, is um, engaging with them, partnering with them. I've represent the landlord. I am the landlord. I ultimately, I've got to increase the value of that asset. And yeah. I've got to make sure I'm returning the uh, investment to the investors, but I've got to make sure that my tenants are, are able, frankly, able to pay their yeah. their their rent ultimately, but also that they're coming in and they're 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 able to fulfill their dreams and ambitions in our center, and that's that that's that's the fulfillment I get out of it is 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 getting to engage that I have two hundred and twenty tenants that I I'm responsible ultimately for their dreams, you know, their life, their job. So um, did GBR for uh, uh, nine years, um, and then got an opportunity to run the NAI. Uh, franchise, uh, and that worked out a couple. Of, uh, that w did that for a couple of years. As it turns out, I'm more of a deal guy, not a great people manager guy. So because uh, uh, I kind of do my own thing, I, like it's, it's it's you know we do things our way, and if you don't do it, then I'm I don't even even need to mess with you anymore. And I I'm just not good at that. Great people, but it just wasn't wasn't right for me. Did that for a year, which was a great place to land, a great place to kind of take my breath, catch my breath, um, and, and really. Made me a better property manager. I'm, I, I've always said I'm a, I'm a I'm a I'm a real estate broker that pretends to be a property manager, and that's that's really it. Because I, a good property manager, uh, uh, is is the one that that can say no, and 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 the tenant says thanks at the end of the conversation. Mm -hmm. They still like and respect you. Uh, it's the property manager that's always, you know, the tenants don't want to see or they don't feel like they're partners in their success. You got to. You know, so uh, that, that's a good point. I just want to comment on that. Um, <clears throat> you know, we have really good, you know, property managers, but I always tell them that you have to be the tenant's friend. Uh, I can be the bad guy uh, in the office that doesn't quite give them their rent reduction or doesn't, you know, pay for the H HVAC, but you, uh, the one dealing with them, need to, they need to feel like you're on their side and you're going to bat for them to the management, to the ownership. Absolutely. And so that, that's a really good point for people that are, that are in the management game is you've got to be able to play that card. And if you want to be the tough guy and the bad guy and deliver that bad news, you're never going to have the relationship you need to get honesty and trust out of those tenants. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, I mean, ultimately you're wanting them to pay the rent. And I, I say that jokingly. I, when I'm showing space, I'm like, I'm going to make sure you're successful because I want to make sure you pay my the 
for rent, you know. So, but and and but when we create that relationship, kidding, not kidding, yeah, yeah. right, right, and they get it. And and if you, I always uh, try to explain them why the lease says what it says. Why, as the greedy landlord, this is the, why we have to have things. And, and if you do that, if you give them that respect, and and they, they're not unreasonable. I mean, the business owners, they yeah. Understand. I mean, sometimes I joke and say tenants are basically like children. You know, <laughs> they'll they'll do exactly what you. Uh, get let them get away with yeah. and so forth and bad behavior and so forth but ultimately you sit down and face to face explain to them here's why this is here's here's why here's why cam went up yeah. you know i mean yeah, yeah it's we had, always a tough we discussion. had three we had three snow events last year and we budgeted for one did you want the parking lot to be icy and yeah. slippery no okay so that's just how it yeah. works you know another and, interesting point you say they'll the tenants will uh you know, get away with whatever you let them get away with. And it's interesting how we're having our, our weekly calls and, and I've had to talk to my staff about, okay, we have, you know, have 10 tenants that are late and it's, you know, it's the 10th, it's the 11th, it's the 12th. Yeah. And I'm like, guys, have you assessed the late fee? No. I mean, we were trying to work with them and I'm like, guys, th- this is why they're not paid on the 10th because yeah. there's no penalty. Yeah. Uh, and so then we have to sit around every week and uh, as a group and talk about it. And then we're going to spend an hour or two hours. We're going to call them. We're going to email them, leave messages. All that's costing us money, all because you didn't do what the lease says, which is assess the late fee on the 6th. Uh, you do that one month, uh, they're going to pay the rent on time next yeah. month. And if they don't, great, you get an extra you know, late fee along with the rent. Because yeah. you know? if they ultimately they don't pay it, then they're going to have to go away. Most of, most of the time, they don't want to do that. They, they want have their business open so it's it's like that with everything though i mean trash is a really bad one we've got a a, a habitat for humanity restore which is kind of um in the like goodwill ish department mixed with an ace hardware i would call it if you haven't been to one but anyway they've got shit behind their store every time you go back there and look and and we were tired of asking so what we did is we just removed the crap from behind the store and we started sending them a bill and they were like, Man, why are you guys sending us these trash bills? And it's like, well, because you don't want to take it up. Yeah. Now, every week, they have somebody come up and pick up their own stuff because I'm sure they found it cheaper than what right. I didn't care how expensive it was. I just wanted it gone. Yeah, restaurants can do the same thing. Yeah, grease get, traps they are freaking disgusting. Behind them and um, it's, you're right. But you, you just, you've got to, what, what I explained to uh, the tenants on the late fee is, believe it or not, we have bills too. I know you don't believe that. Yeah. I know you think every landlord has this bottomless pit of money and we just do this for fun, but we have mortgages. We, we're paying for the lights out in the parking lot. We're paying for your landscaping. And if you don't pay on time, then we can't pay our bills. In 2017, I got introduced to uh, 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 David Charney, uh, Pete Curtis, and Greg Simmons. Yep. So Owasso Land Trust, the Owasso Mafia. It is true. Um, and I sort of knew... Charney through uh, Jolene Saniton and, and different Tulsa things. Didn't know Greg, didn't know Pete at all. Turns out we, at Tulsa, Smallsa, our lives were super connected. We mm-hmm. just kind of didn't know it. Uh, we all fell in love with each other. Uh, uh, Brian Beam was wanting to move on and do more development stuff and kind of get out of that day-to-day asset management. So at the time, I think, I think we had like 470,000 square feet that we sort of managed, and now we're at a million two. Oh, that's insane. Uh, and that, that includes stuff we've built, some third-party stuff, the George Kaiser Family Foundation stuff we took on. Um, and you do other third-party stuff. And, I mean, there's, yeah, there's so plenty we, we've of stuff been, there. Our, our system is um, honed pretty good. We have a good software system, a fantastic staff, and so we found ourselves able to uh, seek out uh, other choice third-party uh, assignments, and, and it's, it's paying off really well. Um, so for five years, that's, uh, that's what I've done. Uh, what I was able to bring to them, uh, they didn't do budgets. They didn't really, it's as sophisticated as they. And you're coming from the Ben and Rusty, you know, both <laughs> CPA budget. Yes. I mean, Nazis. Ben, ben Latham, financial genius. Rusty, greatest deal maker uh, I've ever met. Those two guys, man, uh, was an amazing partnership. And so I've taken from both of them. But Ben taught me the importance of, of, of the penny. He taught me the importance of. Details and I wasn't great at it before, and I'm still not great at it. Like I said, I'm a I'm a real estate broker pretending to be a property manager, but I know enough of it, and I geek out on the uh, on the budgeting process because I like planning. I like looking into the next year and going, okay, what are we doing? How's the roof? How's the parking lots? What are we going to do to enhance this center? And then I t- 
totally geek out on hitting that budget or beating that budget, whether that be, you know, getting more rent than we anticipated or paying less OPEX than we anticipated. And at the end of it going, okay, I told you we were going to return 12 and a half percent, but now it's 15. Or, you know, aren't you happy? And that's, that's where I, I, I really take a lot of joy in doing that. And so that's, that's what we do. So, so we, we initiated budgeting. Uh, we, better reporting now. Is That's it- kind of, cr- I mean, I, I can't get over the budgeting thing. So massive, I mean, massive company and, and not really just, Oh, what did we get this week or month? Okay. Right. Can we pay Can we write checks? Yeah. You know, and, and it wasn't that bad, but it wasn't, it wasn't in that professional. No, uh, you, you may tell the people listening. I mean, the, the Wassa land trust wasn't originally a commercial, uh, you know, portfolio owner, right? right. They, right. they kind of grew into that space. And maybe that's why they didn't have some of the expertise that you were used to having coming from that. That's exactly right. David's an attorney by trade that became a home builder and Greg and Pete are developer uh, residential. Yeah. Uh, I mean, now they, they develop commercial, but originally they were coming as, as one of the premier home building companies in, in the state, in this area, but definitely in Tulsa and Owasso. So, yeah. So they built Owasso, you know, kind of starting in the early nineties, uh, Bailey ranch golf course, all that development. Pete did that. Greg came on and built homes. And so it, in the early 2000s, they kind of looked at the landscape and said, well, we, we got all these people living here now. They need, you know, we, let's build a shopping center here and a shopping mm-hmm. center here. And then they bought a little church and converted it to an office and a, and a retail center. And yeah, yeah. so through the 2000s and, and, and up to the current day, they kind of accidentally got into the commercial real estate business and, 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 and did a great job. Just, just kind of made it up as they went along, right? And then got into apartments. They've done a great job on. Yeah, they built a great apartment. It's gorgeous. I mean, it's gorgeous, and they seem to have made it make money, which is the the, the flip of that coin, right? right? Right. And it was really good if you if you built it five or ten years ago and sold it at you know yeah. last yeah. year's cap rates, you look like a genius. Yeah, yeah that's for sure. It came out pretty sure. good. That's when you buy jets and cool things like that. Um, so anyway, that's what I've been doing for five years, and and um. We've been able to grow the portfolio substantially and kind of create my own little world uh, that is that is not uh, tied to the, the residential, which, as we know, is suffering you know the results of uh, policy changes and so forth right now. So it's nice. They really look like geniuses because I have this portfolio that's, you know, it might slow down a bit, but it's not going to be 08 again. Right. It just right. stops and people can't pay. We all survived COVID uh, and all those rent requests rent reduction requests and i don't yeah, anticipate so, a big problem uh I don't think in this in whatever we're going to hit in the next six to 12 months you mentioned covid rent requests and that's something we've talked about before and and you know we've shared our thoughts and how we handled it how did you and and olt specifically handle covid and and hey we're going out of business or hey we don't want to pay rent for the next three months right. how did how did you handle that i'm curious to know well case by case uh what i used to tell people is honestly if you went to Owasso, you barely knew COVID was a thing. We never, we never did mask mandates. Never once. We, yeah, right. yeah, so we didn't go through some, you know, the political stuff that Tulsa and Broken Arrow did. However, for example, my CC's Pizza. It's a, it's a pizza buffet with a game room. If people don't come in, he doesn't sell pizza. He wasn't set up for delivery. He wasn't set up for curb side. It was a buffet. So we had to work with him. We had to work with our CC's guy, but he's fine. He's a great guy. He owns a million of them. Uh, yeah, we have one. We, we knew he was solid. Greg's a great guy. Is no, the same I, owner? It probably is. The one at Perimeter that he has, the one at yeah. Redbud that we have, and the one that he has in Owasso is the same guy. The same yeah, guy. yeah, 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 yeah. Same guy. He's a great yeah. operator. I think he has 27 of them or something. Uh, he even has some in Texas. So I knew he was solid. I knew he would figure out a way to get through it. Uh, the Andalini's guys, geniuses. They literally flipped in two days. <laughs> found pizza boxes, did the curbside thing. They changed their entire business model from 10% takeout to 90% takeout for that, whatever that period of time was. Never missed a beat. One of the, the takeaways that I had as a business owner uh, through COVID for small businesses was that no small business should ever allow a customer to come into their store without capturing their cell phone and email address. Uh, because once COVID hit and customers aren't coming in, but they still may want your product, but they're banned from coming in from whatever regulation or they're afraid for their safety is you, you can call them, text them. Hey, 
you know, 15% off uh, of you know, home delivery, we'll bring it to your door. Yeah. You know, uh, but if you don't have your customer's information, you are literally stuck uh, at the mercy of whoever walks in that door. And so for the, the takeaway for all business people listening is that you should have a, a gimmick or a giveaway or something. Every person that walks in the door that they exchange their information for some gift or some 10% off or something. Yep. Now you're ready to go. Like you say, switching your business model to 80% delivery overnight. They could have been texting those people and, and hey, let us bring you a pizza buy at half price tonight. Mm-hmm. What do you think of that? Mm-hmm. You know, and so it's really important. You are so right. I tell you, one company that's really good at it is Acai. The smoothie bowl. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Jason's a really smart businessman. And so he opened in Owasso. Has the old dry cleaner spot next to the wing shop, right? Yep. Yep. So they opened in Jinx here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so he does. He gets your cell phone. And man, uh, at least weekly, they text me, hey, we haven't seen you while. Come in $2 off. Yeah. You know, just, just what you're saying. And it's, you know, there's, there's, a, there's an overload of that at some point. But if you're on the front end and you're creating that, I, I love it because it does remind me it, it, it works. Like I'll yeah. be sitting there at 1130 or, or the worst is, you know, when you sit there at your desk and you work through lunch and now it's one o'clock and you're starving, but I don't want to go drive through and get yeah. burgers and fries. But I'm like, well, I'm going to get an assistant. A, hel- a healthy, yeah. 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 feel good about it. Get $2 off. Yay me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that is, so the, the COVID deal was a case by case. Uh, uh, I know some owners who just said, hey, everybody gets a, a free month. We didn't blanket it like that. We, had, I mean, our insurance guys—they didn't miss anything. I mean, you know, there were a lot of people that never missed a beat. Yeah, my was, my big response to to tenants, uh, there were a few that we had to work with, a few, but most of the time they're like, "Hey, we can't pay our bills. Uh, we're gonna have to shut down." And I I would just say, "Prove it." You know, well, that's, do, that's, go do it. That's the Ben Latham model. Show yeah. us, and then and then once the PPP money started coming in. We, we just started directing them to that. Yeah. Very and, and some of them came out. I mean, honestly, that's how CC's guy. And again, he taught me a lot because he was able to pay his employees. He never, he never missed a, but it's, it, it is that. And I learned that in 08. You know, you, you guys lived through 08. 08 was same thing. All those same nationals. It was the nationals. It's the nationals. I have the attorneys and stuff and they'll, they'll uh, let's see what we can get, what we can get away with. Well, in COVID, we lost a few tenants. And so when people said, hey, shouldn't the landlord share in some of the burden here of the pain that we're going through? Uh, and I'm like, yeah. yeah. And the, the, the pain I'm going to share is the tenants that, that actually close their doors and don't pay me rent. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm, I'm eating that. But if you want to stay open, I'm not eating your rent. Mm-hmm. I'm only eating the ones that close. You, okay. If you want to have an open business, you got to pay your rent. And you, you really get to know, okay, who can make it and who can't. Mm-hmm. But you're never going to know... Uh, I, a lot of landlords just agree to free rent mm-hmm. because you don't know if they can pay or not till you till you force them to prove it. Right. So that's, a, that's a, absolutely the right way to go. So coming into OLT, you said you said budgeting was huge. What were some of the other you know key things that you were able to put in place and and I mean put really hang your hat on? I mean asset management, but you you came into this massive portfolio. I mean, what were some of the other things or what are currently some of the things that you do that you think are are just key to driving value maybe yeah. right right so uh, again it, it's it's to me my strength is the tenant relationship stuff and just kind of creating a, a dialogue that is strong through the good times and the bad uh and then uh really taking my my uh, property manager had come from the apartment world so she was talented but just kind of was learning the commercial world and it's different right it is different when yeah. you deal with the tenants it's different the, the five tenants. days versus the 10 days i mean everything about it it's a different fair housing book almost yeah 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 and uh so was able to kind of bring her into my philosophy and the way i look uh, at tenants and and uh and then do do more do more on site be there right and so so i got her i've got a great maintenance guy because a good maintenance guy is half ambassador because because he's the guy that's really on the property more than me you know i'll sign the lease and then i'll try to swing by every once in a while uh but really i probably won't see him see him in great depth until uh it's renewal time i mean i'll, I'll try but really the property manager and the maintenance guy are the ones that have to be that have those relationships so right good maintenance guy is is is, is worth it you know, uh, and then uh, good accounting. Um, so we, you know, the metrics by which we uh, measure ourselves, you know, kind of the 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 growth, the growth of income, 
the, the return on investment, just know it. They didn't really talk about those things before. And it's easier to do when you've bought a property, paid a million dollars for it, da 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 now it's worth a million five. But when you've built it 15 years ago, you got to kind of... They're just you know, enjoying right, the make, cash flow, right? Make yeah. up a little this bit. amazing at that point. So they've been able to pay, they've been able to pay off almost every mortgage, and then those that they didn't, uh, we uh, get some opportunities to get some threes and yeah. three, three and a half mm-hmm. type resets, and um, so like Pine Street Industrial Park is is one. It's a thirty building, one street. It's right there, at Pine and one sixty nine. That's been a fifteen year build out. We are just finishing the last two buildings. One of them's leased. One of them's available. Ninety eight hundred square feet at uh, uh, you know eight nine bucks a foot net. But this thing, they reset it. They they they, they refinanced it last year. And this thing is got a got a twenty year am, and we're gonna be able to dis- distribute distribute um, distribute. Thank you. Can you edit that, please? Yeah. Uh, over a million dollars a year. Wow. And That's it's, ridiculous. It's, it's the perfect. It should be a, a, a case, a case study, study. Yeah, because it it's it's you've got you're taking advantage of positive leverage, and you're, you're returning. Because a lot of times, if you want to pay something down, you just you know, pay out distribution. Mm-hmm. This is it. This thing is it's, it's it really we should we should box it up and make a make a book out of it because yeah. it's and it was a very patient deal. But uh, you know, and, and it's 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 relationships with your vendors, your landscape guy. Uh, your 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 uh, electricians, your roofer. We have great roofer, harness roofing. Is it sponsored by harness roofing? It should be. It could be. Um, yeah, it could be. It's expensive uh, though. Those are those are great guys. Uh, uh, people that uh, can respond quickly uh, to whatever the situation. Right now, great HVAC guys. Eckland, thank you. Uh, those are hard to come by. Oh my lord! And you talk about busy. I mean, the last thirty days, the next yeah, thirty days. Tough. I mean, these guys are going to be flying jets and having you know houses in Aspen. You know, where by the time it's done, oh, my lord, that's um, you're on the global warming train. Yeah, yeah let's do it. Oh my god, well, keep I mean, thing yeah. but yeah, I mean, like a five ton, a replacement five ton unit. I'm gonna be old man on the porch here. You know, it was always it was always a thousand a ton, right? You know, it's five, yeah. five grand. I still remember five that. grand. Now it's double. Yeah, I think we paid ninety two hundred for our last one. I approved one, one yesterday for ninety seven. It's there five ton unit. And, yeah. It was in St. Louis, but. So I mean, you guys, uh, let, let me ask you that. So I'm focused very much on uh, uh, Owasso, Tulsa area. We did, we we have built some uh, some industrial, uh, some small industrial down in Oklahoma City, kind of the west side and the northwest side. But like some of the markets you were in, going back to COVID, did you see a like like the bigger metro areas? Did you see a different response to COVID that affected you differently than your Tulsa properties? I I didn't, but we've gone into those markets. After COVID, yeah, so more I mean, Joel Joel had some Vegas stuff and some stuff in Kentucky and Arkansas. Yeah, they, uh, Vegas. The only challenge we had was they shut down uh, restaurants and and bars, right? So done, done. Like which was kind of right. silly because you have you know hundreds of thousands of people going to huge casinos, right? But but my the bar in my strip center in you know Henderson shouldn't open. Yeah, right. Makes zero sense. No, I mean, but overall, no, we had challenges. Th- throughout the portfolio that we worked through. Uh, we had, even in the center that we office here in Tulsa, we had some challenges, same as we did in, in Vegas. Uh, we lost a, a few tenants, but we're able to, to you know, release them. So I think on the, the multifamily side, your multifamily portfolio did amazing through COVID, right? I mean, amazing. I, mean, I think multifamily word. in general did pretty well because that's the first bill people pay is their, their home, right. uh, their, their mortgage or their rent. Right. And we got some, uh, federal assistance to help those tenants during that moratorium eviction moratorium. And we thankfully uh, had very few tenants that tried to take advantage of that situation. We had a few, but most people uh, overall paid, paid their way through. That is fascinating, man. Multifamily ever since I've met you has just been on this. Yeah. I wish, uh, I wish we would have uh, purchased more of it. All of it. All All of everything. All of everything we walked, if we would have bought, when we did, we would have killed it. Yeah, a but few hundred million dollars. But, I, yeah, you can't spend too much time thinking in the past. I had a question I wanted to ask you before we wrap it up. You had gotten your CCIM designation. Early, uh, too. Uh, and I, I've done all the classes but the final, um, and I probably won't end up getting it now, uh, being, being an owner and not really needing it as much. But I was going to get your thoughts on that. 
Uh, did it help you? Uh, how did it help you in your career? Did it maybe open your eyes to all the different ways of commercial real estate interactions? Tell us about it real quick. Absolutely. Um, so being the guy that sort of slept through finance class in college and cheated off the theta in front of him, mm -hmm. um, I didn't exactly uh, know all the investment principles, the mm -hmm. time value of money and stuff. I mean, conceptually, I got it, but I not not practically. So what CI 101, everybody should take CI 101. It's drinking from a fire hose, but it is just, it is simply that. It's time value of money. If I buy it now and I spend this money for five or 10 years, and I create this value. If you understand that one principle, you can talk with investors, with sophisticated investors. Interesting. The rest of the classes are, have other parts to it. Uh, it so, so CCIM, let's break down what that stands for. Certified Commercial Investment Member. Gotcha. And what it's focused on is investment sales. Am I correct? Yes. yes. Gotcha. Well, investment. It's, it's, it's investment sales, professional leasing. Uh, there, there's some of that as well. It's mm -hmm. not just sales. Okay. Um, it's more, I would say, professional education for someone that wants to be in commercial real estate. Right. Uh, instead of going right. and getting a degree in real estate on a university, which most people aren't going to do, this is something you can do post college that gives you a well rounded overview of commercial real estate professional type stuff. Yes. Yes. And 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 so there's a there's a whole one on uh, market studies, demographics. Uh, there's the sale versus lease analysis. That's a real good one that I still use a lot of. Um, so it did it did a couple of things. This was the '90s. I was new. Uh, what's, what was really cool about it was we did the classes kind of either in Tulsa or Stillwater or whatever. And I did one a year. Uh, 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 and it was, it was Marco, it was Looney, it was Monty Berry, it was Perry Dunham. Uh, it was, uh, Matt Clemish. I mean, all these guys, and now we're the old guys, but we were all the young guys then. And it formed, we just got all got to know each other. Mm, and that's what, wow. that's been vital to my career is my relationship with the other brokers in town. I've always said I'm a broker's broker. I uh, don't, I mean, obviously it's a competition in some ways, but it, to me, we have to work together. Mm -hmm. We have to be kind of above, we have to represent our clients, but we have to kind of be above the deal and get the deal done because without us, deals don't get done. That's why I've said this a million times. My, I hate this when it happens, but the, when we really earn our money is when the buyer and the seller are not exactly happy. They didn't get exactly what they wanted but the deal got done. They're both a because little somebody's pissed. in the yeah. middle going, "Be reasonable. Quit being a yeah. jackass. You, you're not getting. You know, this isn't worth this, and you can't. You need to pay this. And that's when we really earn our money. When everybody's happy and everybody didn't need us. So I kind of look at it that. Uh, so so it, it taught me uh, the education, and then and then the relationships and the networking that I did has carried forward twenty plus years. I mean, I I was uh, I was at a, a dinner last night. You know, there was Marco and. There was uh, Rick Guild and all these guys that I've, uh, you know, I just love that. I love that. It's weird being the age I am and 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 not being the young 30, guy in the thirty nine, right? Yeah, thirty nine and holding. Been in business. So, uh, I, I was gonna, I, I was gonna tell you. You'd ask me about enhancing value, and I was gonna give one last tip on what I did. Yeah. So these guys were sort of primitive in their thinking, uh, uh, kind of country boy type, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but they didn't like spending money on deals and would rather keep the rent low. And so I That's showed them that yeah. within, within reason, if you will spend a little bit of TI money or give a little bit of free rent and then get your rent that you want, the highest that the market will bear, it substantially enhances the value of your property. I mean substantially. The difference between, you know, oh, I'll give you a deal, you won't spend any money, I'll give you for 12 bucks a foot. When the market's 15, 17, 18, and, but they're doing deals like that. I'm like, you're, you're going to keep your value down here if we will spend a little bit of money. And, and, and yeah, do so this. Let's, let's do an example on that, right? Like you've got 5,000 feet and you're getting an extra $3 a foot. Yeah. Right? That's yeah. 15,000 a year. And those are probably seven cap assets or there's That's, seven cap, seven and a half cap. That's okay. Seven and a half cap. It, yeah. That's 200,000 in value. Right. And so, so you spend 20 grand in TI. And so, so that's what I was showing them. You'll spend five bucks. In well, TI. and it's even better than that. Okay. For people that are listening, because yeah, let's say you're going to spend 20 grand, but you get 15,000 more in rent the first year. So you almost, so you're basically, back, yeah. 
uh, if you're going to keep the center, you're getting, uh, what's that, 80% return on that, that money, right? You gave them 25 and you're getting, or you gave them 20 and you're getting a 75% return right. on your money yearly. And so if you think in those terms, and when you, when you sell, you get 10 times the money. Yeah. You're, you're, you, you've enhanced uh, the value. And so uh, yeah. we, you know, that's a huge point when you're talking about leasing is, is rent increases. We've done a whole show on it are so important and it's almost worth any amount of TI, all things being equal to get the rent increases. So we had, we had one office building, two story office building behind El Tequila there. And one space had never been built out. It's concrete, no lights, no ceiling. And last year I spent $275,000 in that building, mm. which is chunky chunk, right? In a 20,000 yeah, square foot that's building. Cool, yeah. uh, so they were all kind of, what are you doing, Bob? What are you doing, Bob? I took the value of it from uh, 1.7 to 3.2. So for 200, so that's the way I had to present it to him. If I told you that I could, if you gave me $275,000, I will give you a million and a half next year. Would you consider that a good investment? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. That's what I did. And that, that's, that's the case study that I showed them the value. So do you think you can get that, sort, that thought process from CCIM? Absolutely. That, those, the, the, those are those principles yeah. in play. Uh, yeah, they go over some of those types of examples. Uh, that, uh, you learn that. And, and you can learn it in a finance class if you pay attention and don't. You know, and you can apply it to something to outside of Actually go to class. Yeah. Uh, but the CCIM helps it, and it puts it in a real estate perspective. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, here, you're buying this building. You're buying this center. You're buying whatever uh, apartments. Um, and so it's good to have those examples, and then you can play with it. You know, some people can take it too far and just – you know, zone people out. But if you just know it in the back of your head, and you can talk it. Uh, that's that's what somebody wants to hear. That's what if you've got you, you know your investors, you you know you got your your guys that I mean, your your pro formas are CCIM in action, man. Mm-hmm. I mean, you guys you guys should give a class on uh, to, you know uh, on how to. But um, but CCIM helped a lot. And at the end, I mean, uh, it's it's to me, it's totally worth getting across the finish line. Just, just from a, just from, hey, I did it. I finally did. I, there's so many people that take all the classes and then they're at the 99 yard line. I know, man. <laughs> this guy, well, this guy over here. I haven't I, started, so I'm good. I'm good. I haven't yeah, started a thing. The, the issue for me, and we got to wrap this up, but uh, I took those classes uh, back 15 years ago, uh, before my real estate companies had really taken off. Yeah, I went, moved out of the country to India. You know, managed an office there. Came back, still worked in oil and gas. Uh, and so then by the time I got back into real estate, my company's kind of, it just was, it wasn't as pressing, but I still, I guess, could, could, could do it. I just maybe have to study, uh, some of those to pass that. Final. There's a course concepts review. Yeah. There's a two day, uh, course before you, get, I'll help you. man. <laughs> so, uh, Bob, thanks for joining us today. Uh, you know, it was a good example and we always try to uh, educate people on this. There's just so many different avenues into commercial real estate. There's so many different ways to add value to be a part of the industry. And once we've, we've talked about it, once you get in the game, then the opportunities start coming your way, uh, whether on the management side, the leasing, the brokerage, the owning. Um, so we want to encourage people just find a way to get in. This industry uh, can make you a lot of money and can be a lot of fun as well. Yep. I love it. All righty, guys. Well, make sure to go to our website and sign up for our investor list so you get all of our investment opportunities. And then Bob, if you want to follow up with him, I'm sure you can find him somewhere at the Owasso Land Trust website or, or something like Owasso that. Land Trust, you'll find me. I'm All everywhere. right. Well, we will catch you next week on how to invest in commercial real estate, Pop. Thanks for coming yeah, on, man. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks guys. Yep.